It's a video. It'll also help to fix what's wrong with Beijing. Beijing, uh, Beijing's air pollution, water shortage, traffic jams, and other urban ailments are the result of it having taken on too many urban functions that are not essential to the job. The plan will connect Beijing and its satellite cities with high-speed rail. It'll also move Beijing municipal government offices to the suburbs to cut overcrowding. But Zhao Yanjin, an urban planner at Xiamen University, points out that Beijing has been trying unsuccessfully for decades to control its population. They may drive out a small portion of the population, but an even larger number will come in. And that, he argues, is because China's central government effectively subsidizes Beijing's public facilities. It does this, he says, by investing the nation's tax money into the capital's schools, hospitals, and theaters. And until residents can get equal value for their money elsewhere, they'll keep flocking to Beijing. Ye Tang yes. of Beijing's Capital University of Economics and Business. In the water. Here, the government allocates the resources, not the markets. The higher your That's official rank, right. the better resources you have. You brought it to me? Thanks, the honey. Thanks. Only <laughs> throw it to daddy? Officials feel the capital no longer needs them. At Beijing's largest wholesale clothing market, vendors are packaging shipments of clothes. The merchants have protested in the streets and been arrested. They say the government wants them to move, but hasn't offered any compensation. One vendor from Chloe Commons, who's afraid of being arrested, asks that I identify him only by his family. Yang? Yang says he moved to Beijing more than 20 years ago, and he feels he's made a contribution to this city. When you said you needed us, we came, he says. Now you don't need us, and you just say go? Yang says he fully supports the government's plan for the mega region. He just doesn't want to be sacrificed for it. Even common folks like us have brought benefits to society, he argues. We're not useless. Anthony Kuhn, NPR News, Beijing. Now, because it is Easter, let's talk about something you might have heard, along with millions around the world, in church today, the story of Mary Magdalene. Some churches have long told the story of a prostitute Jesus befriends and absolves of all her sins. And in the story, Mary Magdalene was the first person who found out he was alive, not in the tomb. Mary Magdalene has even made her way into popular culture. She's a sex worker who marries Jesus in the Dan Brown book, The Da Vinci Code. And she's a prostitute deeply in love with Jesus in the musical Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> Scrappy has it. He's going to guard it now. But here's the catch. In the biblical texts, Mary Magdalene was never described as a prostitute. It's a misconception that started a long time after the life of Jesus and has stuck around for centuries since. The tour of the is a columnist for the White House Post who recently wrote the history of this persistent misunderstanding. Katula, thanks for taking a break from your own Yes. Thank you so much for having me. It's sometimes nice to take that first picture. What's the common perception of Mary Magdalene? Mm -hmm. What do most people think they know about her story? Reformed prostitute, uh, forgiven sex worker. Those are the things that are immediately associated with Mary, both in the theological world and in the secular world. She's a big story. Her story of, of the forgiven father. Gizmo, bring me the torpedo. <laughs> Talking Bible when you talk about her. Gizmo, come on, bring me the toy. Where does that come from? Is there a, a beginning point where that you could point to a 